Hi, Hannah. Hi, Nathan. Hey. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. So we're going to talk about AI. I would say it's the biggest technological shift since the internet. And we're at the stage right now when mature technologies cross-fertilize. But I would say that AI is the underlying force. And as an economist, we always look at when we study technological paradigm shift. We always want to detect what is, what, is the, what is it that we have drastically reduced cost of. Like going history-wise, it would be reduced cost for production, transportation, information, and now predictions. Um, so it creates enormous values. Uh, for, for individuals, society, and organizations. We know that. Yet there are challenges. And that's why my initiative and research is on AI sustainability. Long-term gains. Avoiding short-term pitfalls. So AI sustainability is a purpose-driven approach um, to AI. It's based on Nordic values. We're not saying we're the best on ethic, but we have a history of putting ethics and values on the top of the agenda and combining it with sustainable business models. So it's a form of updated CSR in this data-driven AI area. So it also means we have to demystify AI. We need to govern and measure um, how it's scaling in a broader ethical context. So I want to talk about why AI is different. Why is it so hard for CEOs to, to govern AI? Why is the skills among boards when it comes to AI so long, low? And it is different because considerations are are reproduced by self-learning algorithms on constantly refreshed databases. And in most cases, they're targeted towards goals as profits and increased sales. Because you see that when it's applied, the profits are seductive. And I want to hear your examples on this, Jonas, later. So also the profits are seductive, but the, the ethical pitfalls uh, are hard to detect. So the regulatory framework is lagging. So there's a regulatory blind spot here. So we need to, we see China and US investing on just one side of the coin. That's the engineering AI. Whereas I, I say that we need to, to, to create skills and competence on, on humanistic AI. That is how it's scaling and affecting us. So Jonas, do you want to? Talk about your perspective on, on how AI is different from your... From well, your I, I think I totally agree with you. I think, you know, um, the machine learning AI perspective is really, really, you know, fundamentally changing society as we see it. For me, it's one of the biggest revolutionary since, you know, the internet. It will dramatically change the way we think of actually delivering customer values and customer products. And... Um, and uh, it's so seductive because it's, it scales so fast. And I think that's the challenge for when you come in from an ethical perspective. It's that it's very hard for top management, executives, boards to understand you know, the scaling and how fast this scales. So what started as a very, very seductive, beautiful way of earning more money really comes into a perspective. How do you code you know, values? How do you do that? Because if you code things, you need to have that line of code. Before you could have a gut feeling, this feels yeah. right, this feels wrong. But for me, if we're sitting in the basement and coding it, we need to say, okay, what are the values? I need that code line. That's and like an ethical lens, right? Yes, and, th and that, of course, is difficult. But I, I take the example of, you know, uh, the Chinese emperor and, you know, the, the rice of grains. It's like, you, because if you, this peasant who only asked for, you know, I just want one 
grain of rice for the first board of the chess board, then I want two, then I want four. But if you put that sum together, that's more rice than China would produce in nine years because it's so hard for the individual to understand how exponential growth is. And that is the same thing I see when we're building propensity models and we're doing supply chain. It dramatically changed the way we're doing things. Mm -hmm. And then people are caught a bit off guard. And then, you know, we just had a meeting today and the first reaction is like, can we get rid of data? Yeah, <laughs> like, no one wants to touch oh, it. Oh, oh shit, like, if, we're, it. Yeah. if we're going down this path. It's, yeah. it's, but it's seducive, but you know, companies need to make money, but you also need maybe to backtrack. How do you code your values? That's how yeah, I Yeah, that's the ethical mm -hmm. lens, yeah. yeah. Nathan, w what's your perspective on how AI is different? Yeah, I, th um, I would generally agree with, with what's been said as well. I, th I think the nuance is like, how do you properly express human values in code, especially if you have a very complex value chain? And these models are often trying to learn you know, very complex representations of data, where you know, as humans, we're not necessarily sure what we're looking for. Um, and so how do you properly express that into a function that a uh, that a, that a machine can optimize, and um, and I think this is like best displayed in the in the games world, where uh, you know you can you can use a uh, you can use a function that describes that doing well in this particular game is just high is just scoring very highly on that game, but then you kind of observe the the behaviors that the agent has learned in those in that environment in order to optimize the score, and it often displays things that like humans wouldn't really do, and so as like a toy example that um, that shows you that encapsulating that value function is very important. And we have to try and study how to best express it, or maybe how to like right. build, um, you know, build rails, build safeguards around, right. around these systems, which you know, right. create bounds in which they can make certain decisions or not. Because some critics argue that AI is an experience where you don't bother to look at the result. You just look at the, the yeah. targeted goal variable. And I think from an academia perspective, yeah as well as an organization, you, you work in silos. You have the engineers, but then you have to, you have to educate engineers. How do you detect gender bias? So you, so, and, and I say when, uh, I believe that the, the, the core in AI ethics and AI sustainability should, should lay in the engineer school yeah. because they're the ones that are going to solve the problems. They're, they're the ones that are going to have algorithms to, to detect biases. But they need to have influence, and they need to cooperate multidisciplinary with a gender researcher, uh, with the law, uh, the academics in the, in the law schools. That, so we, need, we really need to get away from the silos as well yeah. as in the organizations. Yeah. I think the general view is just to, to regard that building AI systems is not a purely engineering problem. You know, like b building the system itself might be, and you know, finding the best variables and the best model and the best data, et cetera. But but like these systems are interacting with people, and yeah. and and the most exciting part of building AI is that it's starting to impact like very consequential decisions in people's lives, like health yeah. and yeah. Um, and financial products and, yeah. and logistics, et cetera. So it's about like making sure the teams are working on more than just purely benchmarks, which right. which academia has largely been built around, right? It's like, what is your performance on ImageNet? And that's all that people care about in computer vision. So if we start to change those benchmarks around, then I think that right. that's a forcing function on where like research uh, ends up ends up flowing. Yeah. I, so I would even take it a step further. I think you know the fundamental with AI would actually maybe fundamentally change your business model and your customer offering. So I think yeah. everyone out there needs to look themselves in the mirror and say, okay, mm -hmm. if we implement this, will this change our customer offering? And if it changes yeah. your customer offering, then you're actually either enhancing that yeah. offering or not. But it actually mm -hmm. puts you in a different place. And for me, that's a very strategic move. Right. And then it needs to have a very high governance in the board, in the top executive, because you're actually moving to a new product. Mm. And that, of course, needs to include all parts. And I mm. think just doing that in the basement mm. and coding that and doing it in silos, mm. you've been able to drive business because you've been able to do it in silos because you have a very clear business model. Mm. But if you come to the conclusion this will change your business model right. and we are working, then you yeah. also need to involve mm. much more people to actually rethink what are you serving. And I think you're spot on uh, and also reflecting what has been dis the discussion on many stages here, that from the beginning, you need to, to take the decision on where you want to be on the scale of maximizing your profits or being super 
ethical, right? Because you want to drive profits. But I want to talk about the pitfalls, but the pitfalls are often uh, unintended. So there's discrimination, uh, there's manipulation, there's fake news and privacy intrusive and faulty recommendations uh, and so on. And, and in my research, I, I tried to frame it with with four groups of unintended pitfalls, that's misuse of data. So even though you are DGP, GDPR compliant, your data can be used, or AI can cre create intelligence that, that is privacy intrusive. And that's, I think today we have a false sense of security due to GDPR. And then the second is the bias of the creator. And that's where you, you, the programmer is pro intendedly or unintendedly just programming his, his or her values and also not knowing how it is scaled in a broader context. And then we have immature data. You mentioned, Nathan, that the, the face recognition, uh, how it's not working on, on, on the, the whole of the population. And then where this, the research has got, gone the furthest, that's the, uh, b bias in data, when the data is not reflecting the reality mm -hmm. or the preferred reality. But who's to say the preferred reality? Who's to? So that's also. But I want to hear, Jonas, about the pitfalls, because you've been actually, you, you've been so hands-on uh, yeah. coming to, to the stages where you have to lift um, uh, questions to the boards to, to push them against the wall, saying you have to, you have to decide where you want to be on the scale. Yeah, so I, I built quite a lot of these systems and, and implemented some of them um, as from a consulting perspective. And the interesting thing is when they come to us as builders, they say, OK, we want to drive revenue, we want to drive profit, or we want to take cost out. That's often the initiative of why we want to do AI. Mm. And then you start doing that, and then often it's a, often what people see today is propensity models and these things, you know, upsell, which is great. Mm. And then the second thing, then you actually very fast turn into profit. Um, but that puts the complexity into, okay, how do we rethink? And there's an enormous amount of pitfalls in this, because now you're only pushing against one variable. <laughs> um, and that is profit and cost takeout. And um, I think we should go over to Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I think a lot of the discussion at the moment like relates towards businesses that are um, like obviously based on the internet or enterprise software or transactional. But like another layer into the ethical discussion that I that I think about a lot is um, where there's already proof that machine learning systems can perform better than humans on certain tasks. Um, that uh, that are currently performed very poorly. So, for example, um, like breast cancer screening or, or mammography image analysis. You know, in, in in the clinic today, there's up to 30% false positives that occur and 30% false negatives as well on diagnosis um, of cancers in X-rays. And so, if we already have experimental evidence that machine learning-based systems are um, are better uh, at diagnosing. Um, these kinds of conditions, and same applies to optical computer tomography for the eye, then like, do we not have some kind of moral imperative towards accelerating the implementation of these technologies because just waiting there right. um, and trying to like, retrofit them into the existing like, yeah. FDA regulatory yeah. framework in which not, they don't really fit because they're autonomous decision-making mm -hmm. systems as opposed mm -hmm. to rules-based ones? Mm -hmm. like, I think that's like a yes, flip side of the ethical discussion. Yes, we have as well, yeah. Yeah, I, mm. I, I think so. Are you back, Jonas? I don't know. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I I agree, and it's um, I think it's um, it's a leap. For the, I think the leapfrog of technology can put us in a very you know in different places. And I think one of the discussions mm. we've had is like when you say around biases is like, would you like you know a computer employ someone? And you're uh. like, I, you say no, of course not. And I'm no. like, of course, because I think the bias yeah. there is much much better than the human bias. So I would be much more confident having a computer yes. employ someone than you know. A human, so it's more like what, what kind of perspective do you say? But it, in the end, it's what kind of code do you do and how do you build that? So I want to talk about transparency because at EU level, they talk about standards around the corner for AI ethics, and they talk about transparency, accountability, and predictability. And it's like deploying uh, this, it will really slow down innovation and growth, I would say, but 
not doing it would lead to discrimination and pitfalls. So you really need to adjust it. And from my point of view, uh, I would say that um, the level of transparency must be different in different sector based on the risks and the cost, both the, the financial cost and, and, mm. uh, and the social cost. But what's more interesting is to talk about the explain, um, explaining the algorithms. Because like GDPR it is as it, the right for explanation. Here's your algorithm. Here's we, how we figured that out. But actually, we cannot now, at this moment, explain what kind of data set that caused the algorithm to take a certain decision. So what do we do with the explanatory explain, uh, the, explainability the stuff? Explainability. Yeah. yeah. How Compl do it's we, complex. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think you're totally right, and it depends on sort of like the fault tolerance of the yeah. of, of the of the user, um, and in, in areas where there's low fault tolerance, like where they, they you know they don't want to they don't want to see a mistake that is not that is not fair. Um, there, like I think we have definitely an impetus to explain at least to a professional degree that what a human would do, why a system made a certain decision. And I, and I think you can either do this by choosing certain models that are interpretable, but you can also do this in a way that you design your system to have like sort of intermediate steps that you can, um, that you can peel back um, in order to unveil some of the decision making. Um, so there was another good example in like the eye scanning work where, in theory, you can, you can take an eye scan and then predict whether it's a severe condition or not severe condition that you would um, treat differently. Uh, and you can do this fully end to end with just one big black box, if you will. Um, but it turns out that in the clinical setting, it's a lot better uh, and performs equally well to have this intermediate setting where effectively you're taking in the raw image and just painting it um, where you're labeling each pixel in the image with a specific uh, layer of the eye, mm -hmm. which actually helps the doctor understand, OK, this, this particular layer looks weird, this particular layer looks OK, and that combination means that it's severe or not severe. Um, and so j just by having that little intermediate step provides right. a certain level of right. explainability, which the clinician would otherwise do yeah. anyway, um, performs the same way, doesn't have drawbacks, actually has positivity because it's more transferable across different systems. So I think do that's like think one level. Will of it hamper the slow down the development? Are you afraid of I th I think any standards just slowing down? I, I, I would more address it. I think you know the whole transparency perspective has is a double-edged sword, of course, because especially when it comes to consumers, because I think co companies need to decide if you have like uh, dynamic pricing models, different pricing discounts, how do you display that? Should that be public? Should it yeah. not be public? Yep. I think yep. there's one perspective. What do we de define as public to Could our end consumers? Could you explain that so to the audience how, how that works? And well, it's like every you know the fly, flight industry is really good about you know putting dynamic pricing on your flight ticket, and we have accepted mm. that as consumer, and that is yeah. happening basically all over the industry that you're having dynamic pricing based on recommendations and also loyalty and so on. So that's happening more and more. Um, and then I would say, but if you would be fully transparent with that, people would be very fast in gaming the system. If you know exactly how the flight yeah. industry would actually price their yeah. tickets, mm -hmm. people will be starting doing purchase against it. Yeah. So it becomes difficult from a consumer perspective if you believe in, in price discrimination to have it transparent. But on the other hand, from a company perspective, the executives need to have a very clear view of how they're selling it. And I think this also goes into healthcare, it's like where it's going to be very, very difficult for co governments to be transparent. When do you right. give different kind of healthcare? Yeah. Who, who gets what kind of service in hospitals mm -hmm. and so on? Because there is a gaming element of all of these things. So I, mm -hmm. so I think for, for the people building it, you need to have a very clear view of how you're building a transparency. But I'm not 100% yeah. yeah. clear that it should be 100% transparent against consumers. Yeah. Uh, then the other challenge is it's very difficult to understand exactly what is happening because there's so many layers and yes. so many things and happening constantly. So it's more like, oh, if you show a surfer video, then we can actually sell more coffee because the correlations that the computer is constantly playing with comes up with ideas and thoughts that we could never even have figured out. It yeah. just happens and it tests it and it shows it's positive. Yeah. But, yeah. but putting all that and wrapping that and making it transparent becomes super, super complicated in a boardroom. But who's mm. going to educate the regulators? Who's going to educate our politicians here? Uh, that's your job, Anna. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I'm doing my best. But OK, no, so, but so let's. 
Um, let's go over to what a startup can do. Um, how can a startup um, apply ethical lens from the beginning yeah. and, and scaling in a purpose and, and, and yeah, conscious yeah. way? I think a very, a very simple way to do it is just to be extremely clear with your um, with your uh, data capture, data processing, um, use cases, um, and how that flows into your products, and do this like very simply on your, on your web page. Uh, so th th there are a couple companies there that that very explicitly demonstrate this, and in a way that it's easily digestible and is not like a ten you know ten page like eight point font uh, indigestible piece of information. And I think that's that that's kind of important in this GDPR era because it starts to build way more trust that the business that you're interfacing with actually cares right. about protecting your privacy right. or not right. selling your data to third parties. Um, so I think just communication and, and, and openness and, and just being very clear with what you're doing is uh, is far better than not. Um, and there's countless examples of companies not doing this and really I know. having is to backtrack. That right? like like the, um, is that what's going to spur and, and make, make this kind of um, yeah. transparency I, and, and, and explain it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I mean, I think consumers vote with their feet. And there's you know inordinate number of companies out there that can serve essentially the same value proposition. So right. you, I don't think you can afford to, to really screw up on that, no. on that mark, because it's just another And I also believe, straw. because you want to talk about trust, uh, and I think that's very important, because there's, um, there's a study on, on the paradox on uh, the, the how you um, how you perceive your own integrity level or or border because you can say that you have high integrity but you you are active on social platforms totally paradoxical to to, to to what you say where your integrity lies and I think the the trust issue you you're not gonna read all the the even though the GDPR made it easier for us it's even too hard to grasp. What AI can combine and and mm. and create. So it's mm. it's about what kind of company you trust, what you build in to give away your integrity. Because actually, it's a balance for an individual or, or consumer. It's a balance between giving away your integrity and receiving convenience, time optimization, or efficiency. Mm. And that balance is not based on. Mm. On reading all the the GDPR. No, and I think if, if you go back to the question of startups, I think be very, very clear of your value proposition. What are you offering the customer? What are you selling? And then yeah. nearly all startups need some kind of data feed. So it's just don't get seducted by short-term profit. You really keep you know the eyes on the horizon and, and really care about the product that you really want to build and you want to be proud about. Because it's so easy that you go down a slippery slope in making short cash and you have investors, others breathing down your neck to show better profitability. So have a very clear standards of this is what we want to deliver mm. and, and try to keep that and, and remind yourself of that. Yeah. Because it becomes really difficult to keep track of it, you employ a lot of people, you go from three people to 30 people, you're doing a lot of things mm -hmm. in combination. So if you have a very clear perspective, this is what we're offering, this is what we stand for, this is what we believe, I think that should be your guiding star. And then technology comes in second. Yeah. Because so, so you, yeah. yeah. So we, I'm wrapping up here, but I, we just received a question from the audience that I love. <laughs> it says, from a research perspective, how can we br bring together social and computer science to better understand the impacts of AI? So that's what I'm doing in my initiative. Um, I'm, I'm actually bringing together academic from a multidisciplinary view, regulators, politicians, organizations, and startup to create uh, a regulatory framework for, for responsible AI. And I think what is attracting uh, the other, the social science to this area is that they know that their sector or research area and their, uh, in the long run business cases based on, on research, are going to have uh, uh, AI, um, it's going to be AI um, implications on that. So we all need to understand that. And, and also, coming back to where I am started, um, 
the, the solutions are in the engineering field, but as we go along, the pitfall will, pitfalls will just increase if we don't build up the other side of the coin, the humanistic side of it. Yeah, and I, I agree, and I think we need to think the same way. You talked about silos. Uh, we cannot only have the computer scientists try to solve this. You know, we need to get together with right. the legal people, you know, the philosophers. How yes. do we work with you know, yeah. leadership teams? You know, how do we work together on defining this kind of new code of conduct when it comes right. to how do we do deploy data and how do we work right. with that? And I think it's by bringing everyone to the table and spending the time needed to try to figure out how do we solve this exponential problem. Yeah. Because it's not always a yes or no, because there's a lot of edge cases. How do we do here? And there's a different ways of solving it. Mm -hmm. What are we solving for? Because and it's actually, this technology is actually pushing us to take more ethical stance. And it's pushing us to be, to taking the decision and live it through. I would even put, you need to define the boundaries, you know, mm. how, how, do you, how do you encapsulate things and what mm. do you think is right and wrong? And that comes for me as a business question. Mm. You're just, again, yeah. enabling new technologies yeah. to yeah. drive new business and you need to have values and standards. And that has been, you know, all, all along, you know, what right, kind of quality, what, yeah. yeah. So it's basically, for me, a business model impact. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, okay, I mean, so uh, Nathan, it's yeah. up to you to create a um, hands-on algorithm tool kit for, for purpose-driven AI. It's a bold plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you all for listening, and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. Bye. <coughs>